All right, guys, this is uh, slide one in our 1920s unit. Um, the Roaring Twenties. Um, roaring for lots of reasons, uh, but not right away. Takes a little while to get going after World War I. Uh, takes us a few years to shift from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy, um, but it will get going, and boy, will it get going. Um, so the Roaring Twenties, uh, we're talking Prohibition, Jazz Age, organized crime, um, economic highs, and then an economic low. So lots of, uh, lots of different things here. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started with our first slide on changing ideals. Uh, the 1920s as a decade is all about contradictions. You expect one thing to stay the way it was, but you get something completely different. Um, uh, so kind of be on the lookout for that throughout this whole decade. It's, it's a decade of changes, uh, contradictions. You expect one thing, but you get a completely different one. Um, so kind of look for that in society, um, in education, in women's rights, um, um, in government, lots of different things. Okay. So let's, uh, uh, let's get started here uh, by talking about the, the one sort of event that colors everything else that happens in the decade, uh, and that is prohibition or um, making alcohol illegal. Okay? Um, it becomes law um, through what most people most commonly know, uh, the 18th Amendment. You already hopefully know that. We've talked about it in several different units. Uh, but the 18th Amendment... Uh, passed in 1919, uh, will outlaw alcohol. Right? But an amendment is not the actual law. The actual law that implements prohibition is known as the Volstead Act. Okay? Uh, and the Volstead Act will prohibit um, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of of alcoholic beverages. Manufacture, sale, or transportation of alcoholic beverages. So you can't make it, you can't sell it, you can't transport it. Now, does that mean if you already have some that you're fine? Yes, they, they won't take that alcohol away from you that you already have. Um, but you can't make new. You can't go buy any new alcohol. You can't transport any new alcohol. Okay. Um, now, Prohibition, as you can imagine, uh, and as you see here in the, uh, the, the the political cartoon down at the bottom here, wet or dry, wet meaning keep alcohol, dry meaning outlaw alcohol, um, was a very divisive issue. Not everybody was for it. Not everybody's against it. Okay, um, But let's talk about who supports it and who opposes it. Okay, um, Supporting um, prohibition, right? were uh, people in the South, uh, in particular, uh, whites were eager to keep alcohol out of the hands of blacks because, you know, when you get alcohol in you, uh, you tend to get a little out of control, a little rowdy, um, and that's the last thing whites wanted. So uh, it's a way for whites to keep alcohol out of the hands of blacks. So um, prohibition is popular in the South. It's popular in the West, um, where it kind of represented an attack on, you know, the vices of um, saloons uh, in these Western towns and Western cities, uh, because saloons were, you know, places where you had public drunkenness, prostitution, corruption, all of that. So if we can get rid of alcohol, we can get rid of that. Okay. Um, opposition for Prohibition came in the big cities of the East, where there were lots of immigrants. Uh, immigrants from Europe typically bring with them very strong drinking traditions, and um, they'd like to keep their alcohol. So um, support or opposition really depends on where you are in the country. Right? Now, something you have to understand about prohibitionists, okay, um, these are people who honestly believe that if we could just get rid of alcohol, we could get rid of a lot of problems in this country. 
Um, we could get rid of, you know, poverty, um, uh, spouse abuse, child abuse, um, corruption, crime. We could get rid of a lot of problems if we could just get rid of alcohol. Prohibitionists are not simply people just out to cause trouble. Um, they honestly believe that alcohol is at the root of a lot of this country's problems. So these aren't people just looking to start trouble. These are people who, who honestly think they're doing the country a favor. They couldn't have been further uh, from the truth. Okay? There are a lot of problems with enforcing prohibition. Okay? Um, a lot of people considered drinking a personal liberty, a freedom. We just got done fighting a world war to guarantee people freedoms. Um, and now a lot of people believe you're taking away my freedom, my rights. Um, a lot of people believe that uh, the way to bring prohibition to an end was to violate the law, break the law on as large a scale as possible. So uh, you have people openly violating prohibition. Um, state and federal agencies that were in charge of enforcing prohibition were incredibly understaffed. They're overworked and understaffed, uh, and oftentimes they're bribed. You know, uh, police officers could make uh, a month's salary just in bribes from um, local gangsters running uh, alcohol. So, um, legislators, you know, lawmakers, congressmen are hypocritical drinkers. They come pass laws and talk about how awful alcohol is during the day, and then go home and drink at night. Um, there was alcohol available just not legally. You had to buy it kind of on the black market, uh, which brings us to our next topic here of speakeasies. Okay. Um, speakeasies, as you see in this uh, picture here, uh, speakeasies were secret nightclubs where alcohol was sold. Okay. Um, you could go, and as long as you had money, any drink you wanted, you could get for the right price. Um, Typically, middle, upper-class people uh, went to speakeasies. They'd go for dinner and dancing and drinks. Um, I say they're secret, but really everybody knew where they were. Uh, you just had to know how to get in. You had to know somebody. There would be somebody at the door, uh, the original sort of bouncers here, um, guards. At, if you did not know the password, you did not get in. In fact, that's where the nickname comes from. Uh, when you got to the door, you were told to speak easy and keep your voice down. So other people didn't hear the password. So you had to know somebody to get in. But once you were in, anything you wanted uh, was yours for the taking. Now, if everybody knew these places existed and where they were, how did they stay open? Easy. Owners bribed police officers. Um, you had, if you owned a speakeasy, you had several people being bribed in the local police office uh, and when a, a, a raid was going to go down, they'd give you a call and say, hey, the feds are going to show up tonight, you know. Um, feds would show up, they'd come in, but there wouldn't be a drop of alcohol anywhere because you'd gotten rid of it, you'd hidden it, you'd taken it off the premises because uh, you knew you were going to get raided. And as soon as the feds left, the alcohol came back out. Um, so speakeasies... Uh, um, Speakeasies were, were prevalent. There were lots of places. Uh, and if you knew the right people, you could get in and get any kind of alcohol you wanted. Now, if you didn't know how to get into these places, you had to get your alcohol somewhere else. Uh, that's when we get to smuggling. Uh, or perhaps you, you made your own. Uh, sometimes it was called bathtub gin. Uh, homebrew. People would make their own alcohol at home. And literally... Uh, they would brew it in a bathtub. Um, so it's called bathtub gin. Uh, it wasn't very good, apparently. Um, and depending on who you got it from and whether they knew what they were doing or not, uh, it could kill you. Sometimes uh, uh, home brewers would cut their alcohol to make it go farther. Uh, and who knows what they cut it with. Okay? Um, I'll show you a pretty good video here uh, in class today about prohibition that will give you some better ideas about this. But smuggling was a big deal. Um, alcohol was smuggled into the country. You see the, uh, uh, the, the book here, um, Moonshiners, Bootleggers, and Rum Runners. 
right? Uh, moonshiners are what you think they are. The, uh, you know, backwoods people you say, see on the, uh, the cover of the book here, the still, um, uh, out in the middle of the woods, they brew their own um, moonshine and sell it, you know, to people that they wanted to sell it to. Um, bootleggers were people who would smuggle alcohol on their person, like, you know, moonshiners put it in the, the trunk of their car and take off. Bootleggers got it because they smuggled bottles of alcohol in the legs of their boots. That's where the nickname bootleggers come from. Uh, rum runners, a little more uh, in detail here, rum runners would smuggle alcohol um, onto shore from the ocean. Right? Uh, rum is made from sugar, and sugar is made in uh, or grown in the Caribbean. Um, so um, people would go to the Caribbean, they'd load up boats with rum, come up the east coast of the United States, uh, and drop anchor off the coast of the United States in international waters where they couldn't be caught. But the problem then was you had to get it ashore. So uh, rum runners would take uh, small little speedboats, um, soup them up with as fast an engine as they could, head out to these ships, buy rum, load it onto their little boat, and take it ashore. Um, now the people doing all of this, uh, the people running speakeasies, the people... Um, smuggling alcohol, the people that you're buying alcohol from, if you're buying it on the black market, uh, organized crime, mob, the mob, gangs, okay, uh, which is what we'll talk about here in just a uh, just a moment. Okay? But before we get to that, there were a couple of whoops, sorry, there we go. There were a couple of minor successes, not a lot, uh, really only two that we can really point to with any certainty. Two successes that come out of Prohibition. Uh, number one, bank savings did increase. Not sure how, but we do know for a fact that bank savings accounts went up during the 1920s. More people, they have better jobs. They're making more money, but they're also spending it uh, on alcohol somewhere. Uh, but bank savings increased and absenteeism at work decreased. Prohibitionists would have you believe it's because, you know, they're not drunk at home hungover. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the case, but people did miss less work. Could be just be that they had a better job and they made more money, so they wanted to go to work. But prohibitionists will have you believe that both of these are due to prohibition. I doubt either of them are due to prohibition. Um, we said earlier, prohibition causes lots of problems. Um, and the biggest one is organized crime, um, or the mob, okay? Um, they run the speakeasies, they control out the flow of alcohol in this country. Um, the, the biggest smuggling city, um, in the United States is Detroit, because right on the other side of Detroit is Canada. Um, and Canada had export laws. You could brew alcohol, uh, and liquor, uh, beer in Canada for export, so uh, the mob, smugglers, would go across the border into Canada, load up, and smuggle it back through Detroit. Okay? Um, in fact, Detroit was run by a mob, was controlled by a mob, uh, known as the Purple Gang. Funny name. Uh, the Purple Gang. They are described as being uh, short on brains and long on muscle. Uh, they'd just soon kill you as look at you. Uh, so you didn't dare cross the Purple Gang. Uh, and if you were part of organized crime, the mob, there's a good chance you bought alcohol from the Purple Gang because it was coming in, most of it, through Detroit, which they controlled. Now, the most powerful, the most well-known of all mob bosses was Al Capone. Okay? Uh, and here you see a picture of Capone up in the, uh, uh, the top left-hand corner of the slide there. Capone is the most well-known, uh, probably the most dangerous of all the mob bosses. Um, he controls Chicago. Uh, that's where he's based out of. Uh, Chicago was one of the deadliest cities in terms of mob violence. His big rival was a man named Bugs Moran. Okay? Uh, and Moran pretty much controlled New York. And Capone and Moran fought for control of both cities. But Moran worked out of New York, Capone out of Chicago. Uh, if you ever get to Chicago, there's a great tour, uh, walking tour you can take of Al Capone's 
haunts. Uh, so do that. But uh, Capone and Moran would fight and fight. The most well-known of all the, the mob killings um, occurs in 1929, February 14, 1929, known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Okay. Um, members of uh, Al Capone's gang uh, will gun down um, assassination style here and kill seven members of Bugs Moran's gang. Uh, Moran was the target. He wasn't killed, luckily for him. Uh, there was a, a fake meeting set up. Uh, Capone, with the help of the Purple Gang, uh, had contacted, uh, the Purples had contacted Moran and said, hey, we've got some excess, uh, some extra alcohol. You're interested in buying it? Moran says, sure. So they set up a buy that Moran is supposed to be at. Uh, members of Capone's gang, um, dressed in police uniforms, driving police cars, show up to raid the buy here. Uh, so they bust in with their machine guns and all that. Uh, they grab the members of the Purple Gang and take them out, presumably because they're arresting them. They're not, because they're working together. They just let the Purples go. They line Moran's men up against the wall and machine gun them all in the back. Okay. Um, seven members of Moran's gang are dead. Moran was supposed to be at the meeting, but he was late arriving. Um, he's coming down the street to get dropped in his car. To get dropped off there, uh, he sees the police cars out front and just keeps on driving. So uh, had he not been late, Moran himself would have been killed, and that's what Capone was shooting for. Um, Capone um, will uh, ultimately be brought down by a group of FBI agents known as the Untouchables. They are led by, the head, the FBI agent in charge here, is a man named Elliot Ness, N-E-S-S. -S. Uh, and the Untouchables get the nickname because uh, they can't be bribed. They won't take a bribe by uh, Capone. Um, eventually, after many years here uh, of fighting, uh, the Untouchables eventually will bring down Capone. A uh, real good movie called The Untouchables stars Kevin Costner, uh, Sean Connery, uh, about Capone and Elliot Ness and all of that. Um, eventually, Capone will be brought down and sent to prison, uh, but not for what you think of. Capone's, you know, the deadliest man in America, but not a single gang-related charge can stick. They, can't, they never find him guilty of any gang-related violence because nobody will testify against him. Um, eventually, uh, Capone is convicted on tax evasion charges. Uh, Capone has all this money, but he hasn't been paying taxes on any of it. So here the, the deadliest man in America goes to jail for tax evasion, not paying his taxes. Um, he will serve most of an 11-year sentence, I think nine-plus years, um, in jail. Uh, he was released and died of uh, syphilis, a sexually contracted disease um, that he gets from one of the many prostitutes that he employs. Okay. Um, sources of income, the mob will make a whole lot of money. Um, by 1930, they're making anywhere from, it's hard to know because it's all illegal, um, but 12 to 18 billion dollars a year. Uh, 12 to 18 billion dollars annually uh, by 1930. Where are they getting it all? Alcohol is the big one. Okay, um, Running the speakeasies, uh, controlling the flow of alcohol in black market, that's the big one where they get most of their money. But as the, the 20s go on and into the 30s and the 40s and 50s, especially when alcohol becomes legal again, they got to get money somewhere else. Um, so they get into prostitution, uh, narcotics, drugs, uh, gambling, running casinos, things like that. Um, legal businesses are forced to pay protection money. Uh, the mob can either be on your side or against you, and you don't want them against you. So you pay them to leave you alone. Um, so organized crime could not have succeeded without prohibition uh, because they get their money, they get their power by controlling something that you can't get legally. And during prohibition, that is alcohol. So prohibition caused organized crime.